Laurit. So we see many familiar faces and it's our pleasure to have our first prelude session for the PLS 2020 conference. Actually, we started to do um, this conference this March and uh, for the known reasons we had to postpone the conference and now we decided to have the next PLS conference at the end of 2022 in Beijing, China. Beihang University is hosting um, this meeting and we very much hope that the situation is getting much better until the end of 2022. And what we would like to do is until then, we would like to take the opportunity to entertain you a little bit with our prelude sessions. And uh, this is the first one on recent advances in predictive model assessment by Marco Saarstedt and myself. I'm Christian Ringle, and I'm with Hamburg University of Technology and the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And here at Hamburg University of Technology, I'm head of the Institute of Human Resource Management and Organizations. And uh, this is what we do in research and teaching. But besides, um, I'm currently the Dean of the Department of Management Science and the Executive uh, Director of International Affairs of Hamburg University of Technology. So whenever you like to have a collaboration with our university, um, I would be the right contact um, to talk about this matter. And um, what we are going to do now is after an introduction into the topic, um, we continue with the PLS predict method before we um, look into predictive model selection using first information criteria. And then secondly, a new test um, that has been recently published at the CDPET. And then we simply close the session um, by the core takeaways and an outlook on what's coming next, namely in prelude session number two. So at this point, um, I would say it's a good opportunity to say hi to Marco, and uh, you probably will start with introducing um, yourself and going into the intro. Yeah, right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you virtually. Um, I actually have um, preferred to see you in person at the conference, but um, while well, um, Christian was actually um, saying a few words of introduction. I'm actually looking now at the chat and I see people from all over the world. We have uh, Africa, Burkina Faso, Israel, USA, Croatia, Italy, Morocco, Turkey, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, um, just a few uh, locations um, of colleagues that are with us uh, at this moment. Wow, yeah, what can I say? This is really an international crowd and isn't our profession fantastic, yeah? um, bringing together people from all over the world. Um, so I'm, I'm super happy. Yeah? I hope you noticed that. Well, let me just briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, Markus Arstedt. I'm a professor of marketing at the uh, Otto van Gerich University in Magdeburg. Um, you might have no clue where that is. Uh, it's in the middle of Germany, um, somewhat near Berlin, actually, from at least an outsider's perspective, I can say. And I'm also an um, adjunct professor at Monash University, Malaysia. Um, so my research actually, uh, well, <clears throat> as you might guess, in partially squares and research methodology, but actually by training, I'm a business researcher and I have a chair of marketing. So I'm actually also doing um, consumer research on uh, sensory marketing, um, product line extensions, a bit on pricing, um, actually currently more on ambient sense. So it's very different from what we'll be talking about um, today. So um, let me just kick things off by a uh, short introduction um, to the general topic. Yeah, so it's uh, recent advances in predictive model assessment that we're gonna be talking about. And let me kick, kick things off by showing uh, this uh, young uh, gentleman to you. Um, you likely have no clue who that is, right? And to be honest, um, I wouldn't know either, yeah. This person is Edmund Halley. And Edmund Halley was actually an English astronomer, uh, a geophysicist, a mathematician, meteorologist, and physicist. And um, he was like very popular among his time. So actually Halley 
recorded uh, the transit of Mercury across the sun. His observations actually helped, helped proving Isaac Newton's laws of motion. And in one of his later works, actually, in um, 1682, he actually um, tried to explain and forecast the periodicity of a comet. And that was actually um, written down in a 1705 book, which is highly popular, the synopsis of the astronomy of comets. And um, he actually described in great, or went great lengths in describing this transit of a certain comet, which you can actually see here, it looks pretty complicated, yeah. And um, there is actually one line which I would like to emphasize here in his work. Hence, I dare venture to foretell that it will return again in the year 1758. So actually, he predicted the return of that comet in 1758, and unfortunately, he did not live to see it. Yeah, but actually, his predictions proved right. So what you see here is actually the last picture of uh, Halley's Comet, last appearance of it in our solar system in 1986. And it was actually not the explanation that you saw on the, on the previous slides, which really inspired people's minds. It was actually the variability of his predictions, which had a lasting impression on the people. So while the explanations and the theories are certainly important, yeah, it's actually the prediction of certain events that help us to verify our explanations and also to question our explanations and maybe our theory too. So this is something that you can actually see in all types of research that are out there. Yeah? For example, here, Richard P. Feynman, um, Nobel Prize winner, uh, he said, I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics, but in fact, it was the undisputed um, understanding and predictability of quantum mechanics, which helped sparking the semiconductor revolution. That also holds for other fields um, of research, yeah? for example, for marketing. Yeah? So this is not limited this importance of prediction to the uh, natural sciences, to what we call the, the hard sciences, but it also holds for many business research areas like marketing here. Yeah? So if marketing research is to perform a useful function, it must put finally in the term, in the form of predictions for the use of management, written here in a classic article in the Journal of Marketing, 1953. So this is some years ago, as you see. Similarly, in a like, classic book by Kaplan, uh, it remains true that if we can predict successfully on the basis of a certain explanation, we have a good reason and perhaps the best sort of reason for accepting the explanation. So here, Kaplan talks about an interplay of explanation and prediction, or explanation here understood actually as confirmation, yeah? confirming a certain theory, confirming a certain model, but we're going to be talking about that in a second, a bit more detail. So, um, in fact, if you take a look at a bit more recent literature, there's much to be said about prediction and explanation. Here, there's a classic article, I believe, at least it will be a classic article, by Hoffman and colleagues, published in Science. Yeah, And here, Hoffman and colleagues talked about the prediction and explanation in social systems, and we as business researchers, and I'm just assuming that, that most of you are actually also working in business research, yeah, deal with some type of social system, whether you're working in, in marketing, whether you're working in some type of behavioral economics and hospitality and tourism, doesn't matter. We're always looking into social interactions, into attitudes and behaviors. And here in this article, Hoffman and colleagues say that in fact, the prediction driven explanation yeah, so looking into prediction and deriving explanations from these prediction has proven uncontroversial in the physical sciences. It's uncontroversial. Us, like social sciences and contrast, have generally de-emphasized the importance of prediction relative to explanation. And every one of you that has ever tried to publish a paper without a theory section or without a set of hypothesis will probably uh, understand what the statement means. Yeah, it's virtually impossible 
to get published into at least decent high tier journals without having like a sound theory, without having a set of hypotheses. We kind of second nature to us these days, right? We have to come up with a set of hypotheses, a theory that we uh, use. And then based on the theory, we test the propositions empirically. Yeah, this is not necessarily the case in other fields of science, yeah, like the natural sciences. So they actually criticize the, the social sciences a bit, as you can see down here, and say, OK, rather than asking whether a given theory can predict some outcome of interest, the accepted practice in social science instead asks whether a particular question in an idealized model, you know, slight critique, yeah, is statistically significant and in the direction predicted by the theory. So we actually strongly de-emphasize the role of prediction in our research. And this is somewhat surprising, to be honest, yeah, because what we try to achieve in our research is actually inherently predictive. So on the one hand, take a typical article here. Um, it's one of ours, actually, published in the journal the Academy of Marketing Science. So on the one hand, we establish a theory, and based on the theory, we derive hypothesis, which we then empirically test. Uh, we can see that here on the left-hand side, set of hypothesis H1, H2, and H3. However, at the same time, we want to derive recommendations for practice. Yeah, so you, have you ever tried to publish an article without having some type of practical recommendations or managerial recommendations section? I guess it's going to be difficult, right? And um, here you can see these statements are actually inherently predictive in nature. Yeah? Because what we see here is basically saying, OK, we recommend companies should do this and that. So we say, if the company does something, something else will happen actually in the future. So this is a predict predictive statement. We test the hypothesis based on a certain data set. Yeah, that we actually have um, have gathered in the past. And we assume that whatever we observe using these data is going, also going to hold in the future. Because otherwise, there would no point in making recommendations. Yeah? So companies should do this and that. Because we claim that if they follow our advice, something will happen in the future. So these statements are predictive in nature. But somewhat surprisingly, this has actually hardly ever been tested. So prediction is actually not our concern when testing statistical models. This holds for regression analysis, and this also holds for structure equation modeling. And that's the focus of our session today. Yeah, so let's you can see what you can see here. And I'll just assume that um, all of you will know what that is. The structure equation model, we have uh, certain uh, constructs here, which are labeled as F or as factors in this case, you know, so F1, F2, F3, and F4, which are measured using one indicator or multiple indicators, which are somehow uh, included in a path model. And we assume certain relationships among these factors or constructs based on theory and logic. And um, there are basically two approaches for estimating such types of models. Are the factor-based approaches and composite-based approaches. So I don't want to get into too much detail here, but this, this distinction is important for you to understand the role of composite-based structural equation modeling when it comes to prediction. So both these approaches, factor-based and composite-based, stem from the same school of thought, namely Hermann Wald, who was a Swedish econometrician. Uh, he was mainly dealing with time series models in the latest stage in his career. Again, interest in the causal interpretation of multiple equation models. And from this school, basically, these two approaches emerge factor based and composite based, which have very different characteristics. One of the most fundamental characteristics is actually the way they treat the constructs or the conceptual variables in a statistical model, to be more precise. So, in the factor based world, they are considered as common factors. So the correlation among indicators is used to identify these factors and to estimate the relationships that you hypothesize in your structural equation model. This is kind of, or has long been, 
the standard approach. And this, this is what's carried out by programs such as AMOS, Literal, M+. Composite-based approaches, on the other hand, they form composites out of indicator variables. So rather than just using the correlation, the common variance of the indicators to estimate the model, what we do here is weigh the individual indicators in a certain manner to get composites. These composites then represent the conceptual variables in a statistical model. The most popular prevalent approach in that field is partially squares, but it's by far not the only one. You could actually even perceive like some scores regression as a composite based approach, maybe not structured structure equation modeling, but this is more a terminology thing, but certainly um, an approach like um, generalized structural component analysis, which is also a prominent approach for composite based structural equation model. So the problem when it comes to prediction is that factor-based SEM is grossly unsuitable for that task. And I don't want to get into the technical details too much, but the underlying reason for that is a characteristic called factor indeterminacy. What does that mean? Well, factor indeterminacy means that the scores of the constructs in your model are indeterminate. Yeah. In fact, you can get the same model estimates, meaning the same pass coefficients, loadings, fit statistics, you name it, um, for totally different sets of factor scores. So actually there's an infinite number of factor scores which will produce the same results. That's a bit of a problem because if the scores are not determinate, how do you actually want to predict them? Yeah. And that's actually nicely illustrated by this paper here by Schoenemann and Hagen, which is some years old, but they actually used intelligence factors from the US population. Uh, so they, they used the known distribution of these um, intelligence factors, generated data according to these known distributions. And then they used these intelligence factors to predict the dates of Easter Sunday from 1961 to 1989. So the exact the exact score month date. And in fact, they were able to perfectly predict this dependent variable using the intelligence factors of the US population. So there's absolutely no logical relationship among these, right? I mean, why should the dates of Easter Sunday depend on the intelligence factors of some population? Uh, but that's the point. When it comes to prediction, factor models, or covariance-based SEM is grossly unsuitable for this task. So how about composite-based SEM? And you might already guess, well, composite-based SEM is actually the method of choice for that. Yeah, because as I mentioned before, composite-based SEM forms composites out of the indicator variables. So this is shown here by these dashed lines. So we have uh, three variables, Y1, Y2, and Y3, and they are somehow linearly combined using some type of weighting scheme to come up with a factor score. Importantly, this direction from the indicators to the concept just refers to the way the model is being estimated. The question whether you would perceive these indicators as reflections of the underlying construct or causes of the construct being like formative or reflective distinction. Yeah, that's on a totally different sheet of paper. Yeah, you know, what we are talking about here is not the measurement theory. The measurement theory is independent from the actual model estimation. The model estimation here uses linear combinations of indicators to represent the constructs. But this is different from which type of relationship you assume from a measurement theory perspective. That's actually something that um, some colleagues actually mix up yeah? by uh, mixing up model estimation and measurement theory perspective. We get lots of confusion out there because they say, well, if, it's, um, uh, if the uh, indicators are linearly combined to form composites, then it's like formative. Yeah? And this is a bit short-sighted in our point of view because you can represent such a model using composites, but yet it is a reflective measurement model. So this is not a problem. 
So with that having being said, yeah, we can use composite based SEM for prediction because there are actually things that we can predict. The question now is, how do we do this? Uh, and there are basically two approaches or two viewpoints on prediction. We have the in-sample prediction and the out-of-sample prediction. And these are actually two ways to look at a prediction perspective, which are basically shaped from different viewpoints, yeah, from econometrics and also from data science perspective. And there's much confusion actually some of that confusion was actually also caused by us because in our early writings, we also did not clearly differentiate these terms. Yeah, so in sample prediction, out of sample prediction. Yeah. So this is something that we're gonna be talking about now uh, when we talk about PLS predict, which is a, a method for out of sample prediction, predictive power assessment in PLS SEM. So with that being said, I hand over to uh, Christian is going to be talking about this wonderful topic in a bit more detail. Good, <clears throat> wonderful. Thank you very much, Marco. And I'm now switching to the PLS path modeling or PLS structural equation modeling perspective. And uh, to start this one, let's go back into 1982 when Hermann Wold and Karl Juriskog um, the two founders of the two methods that Marco just described, covariance-based structural equation modeling, uh, Karl Juriskog, and on the other hand, PLS uh, uh, structural equation modeling, Herman Wold. Um, they had this joint article, and in this joint article, they described these methods as being complementary. And um, you use each approach for a certain goal. And um, the goal that is attributed to PLS structural equation modeling is its causal predictive perspective. And um, whenever it goes into prediction and into the causal uh, predictive um, direction, you would use PLS SEM. However, the issue at uh, a certain point, until a certain point was, even though we know that PLS SEM is quite valuable um, for a predictive um, perspective, the evaluation criteria um, related to the method um, have been quite weak. First, um, what we had on the table for a long time simply was in-sample explanation and in-sample prediction, but out-of-sample predictive approaches um, have not been uh, available or only to a limited extent um, to being available. And that changed um, rel relatively recently uh, with an, an article by Galit Schmeli and co-authors in 2016, the elephant in the room, evaluating the predictive performance of PLS models published in JBR. And um, we had the opportunity to later work with Galich Muli on this topic. And we had a follow-up article, predictive model assessment and PLS SEM guidelines for using PLS predict. And this article was published in the European Journal of Marketing. And these were, um, the first uh, true out of sample predictive assessment approaches that have been introduced uh, to PLS SEM. And we are going to introduce the PLS predict method now. So let's take a look and um, I need to quickly see if I can switch the slides. Yes, here we are. And to go into the terminology and uh, what uh, Marco already uh, build the grounds for is to distinguish between in-sample prediction and the explanatory power and out-of-sample prediction. So the first turn, let's first turn to in-sample prediction. So what we do here is we have our sample data. So we collect the data maybe from a survey and uh, this data is now available and we have our indicator um, for the predictors, the exogenous latent variables in a um, PLAS path model and our outcome indicators, um, those Y indicators of the endogenous ones. And um, these are now the indicators assigned to certain latent variables. And what we can do with this data set is we can estimate the model and um, with the model estimation, we can uh, next uh, get uh, the estimated parameters. For example, for the relationships in the structural model or for the relationships between um, a latent variable and its underlying indicators. Good. 
based on these estimated parameters, it's now possible to predict um, the um, Y um, data, so the indicator data for Y, and we get estimation outcomes. Um, and uh, that is uh, described here by Y hat. So when we use um, the predictors X and our estimated parameters, we can um, get the estimated outcomes Y hat. And um, based what we do here on this in-sample prediction, we get uh, the estimated residuals, namely the difference um, between the observed outcomes, Y, and what we um, predicted um, within the sample. And on grounds of these estimated residuals, how close our um, observed variables and uh, our estimated um, outcomes are within the sample, we get um, figures for the explanatory power such as R square or the F square effect sizes. So this is um, a first good assessment of the um, in-sample predictive quality. But it's also comparable um, to a classroom. And most of us have some experience in teaching, in teaching at university and your courses. And um, just, re just imagine your observations are your students. And um, you get the assessment based of, on a certain class. And uh, uh, you get the indication how good a certain model is to explain, for example, the performance of your students based on the observations we have in class. But now there's another purpose. Let's imagine there is a new student walking into the class or joining the class. And based on your model, you would like to know how good um, can you predict the performance of this new student. And this is um, a completely new question. And um, for this purpose, we um, like to do out of sample prediction. And um, with the out of sample prediction, we look into um, a different goal, namely the capability um, to predict um, uh, the performance, uh, coming back to our example, of a new entry who joins um, the class. So then out of, in order to determine uh, the out of sample predictive quality, what we do is um, we take our sample data and uh, the sample data is now split into two parts. The first part is the training data set and the other part is the testing data set. And the training data is similar to our existing class, our group um, that we already know. And uh, the testing data, this is um, like the new entry, the new students who join the class and um, for whom you would like to use the model to already predict their performance when they are entering the classroom. So what do we do now? We use our training data and with the training data, we estimate the model. And again, um, we get estimated parameters. And what we now do is we use these estimated parameters to predict the outcomes of the training data. And um, for this purpose, uh, we take um, our X data into the model and uh, the estimated parameters to predict the outcomes of our testing data Y hat. And based on the predictions of um, the new entries, our testing data, we can compute the prediction error, which is the difference um, between the prediction and the Y data, which we know since we um, excluded them from the original data set, but we have the responses ready at hand, and therefore we can compute the prediction error. And based on the prediction error, we can compute um, uh, popular uh, measures like the root mean squared error or the mean average, um, uh, uh, mean absolute um, uh, um, error to uh, assess the predictive power of um, yeah, uh, the model that we have at hand. So let's bring um, this into a further illustration on the next slide. And um, what we do here is uh, to collect um, the basic terminology. And we use um, the very basic uh, terminology to first distinguish between the training data and um, the holdout sample, our testing data. So the training data is um, simply what we use um, to estimate the model to get the path coefficients, weights, loadings, and uh, similar in a PLS path model. Our holdout data or testing sample is um, the data that we did not include for the model estimation. And um, we now use um, our results for the path coefficients and so on to predict um, the outcomes of our testing data 
And based on the prediction error, we get uh, the RMSE, the root mean squared error of predictions, the um, MAE, the mean absolute error, or the mean absolute percentage error. These are three well-known and famous um, criteria to assess the predictive quality of a model. Per default, or um, as a standard um, value, we use the root mean squared error, the RMSE. And um, sometimes um, you can use the mean absolute error, the MAE, um, which is more accurate um, when the prediction errors are highly asymmetric and highly asymmetrically distributed. What you usually do not um, want to use is the mean absolute percentage error because it has some uh, downsides. For example, when there are outliers in the data, it's known to be um, yeah, get, getting too, um, uh, yeah, too optimistic results. Or when you have left skewed or right skewed data, it tends to over or underestimate the predictive performance. So typically we use the root mean squared error. And how do we transfer this knowledge now to um, PLS SEM and uh, into a procedure which we call PLS predict. And for this purpose, we switch to the next slide. And um, here we have the PLS predict uh, procedure and um, its underpinnings are a K-fold cross-validation. So what do we do now? Here's an example where we split the data set into five folds. You could use um, also 10 folds, um, that is a typical number also used, but just for illustrative purposes, we use five folds here. That means we split our original data set in five more or less equally um, sized um, folds. And when we have, um, uh, for example, 2000 observations, um, we then attribute um, one fold becoming the uh, testing data set. That is in this case, if we split it into uh, five folds, 400 observations, and the remaining four folds become the training data. So this is 1,600 observations in our example. So one fold always becomes the testing data set while the remaining data is the training data. So now we start um, with the first um, training data set and this would be the first row, fold two, three, four, five. This data is used to estimate the PLS path model. And based on the coefficients um, that we obtain for the structural model and the measurement models, we can now predict the outcomes of our testing data. And for the first fold, we compute um, the predictions. But since we have the actual responses of this data set, since we simply just excluded um, this data set from um, the model estimation, we have responses at hand. We can now compute the prediction error of fold number one. And we continue with this procedure. Fold number two becomes um, the uh, testing data, while the other folds are the training data. And again, we estimate the model, use our estimated coefficients to compute the prediction error for um, fold number two, continue with fold number three, four, and five. And with fold number five, um, we then predicted um, uh, the results of all observations in our data set. And at the end um, of the procedure uh, with fold number five, we now have the prediction error of every single observation in our data set. And this is now what we can use in the next step to compute um, uh, certain figures. And the certain figures are um, naive benchmarks. Of course, um, when you get the prediction error, the prediction error is a certain number. And this certain number cannot be evaluated without a benchmark. Why is it so? Well, if you have a larger data set, with a larger data set, and you simply sum up the prediction error, you get a larger sum of prediction error. Um, the, uh, the prediction error or the sum of prediction errors becomes smaller when you have a smaller data set. Or the same with the dependent constructs. If you have many dependent constructs with many Y indicators, then your prediction error uh, becomes larger and becomes smaller if you have, for instance, just a single dependent construct with one or two in indicators. So the absolute value of uh, the sum of prediction errors doesn't tell you much and you need a certain benchmark. 
And um, these benchmarks um, are usually very naive predictions. So the question that you like to answer, you now did the prediction of the outcomes by using the PLS model. But if you would use alternatively a very naive approach, the most simple prediction possible, can you beat with the PLS SEM model prediction this naive benchmark? And um, the most naive benchmark we can Im imagine is a mean value prediction. So when you remember, we have our training data and we have our testing data. If you just take the training data and compute the average value for our Y indicators and take these average values of these Y indicators as the predicted values. So these are the predictions, these average values. And you then compute the prediction error based on the average value of your Y indicators of your training data. That's the most naive prediction you can imagine. And um, the uh, question that you now ask is the PLS SEM prediction advantages in comparison to simply using the mean value of your data as a prediction of the new entry into the classroom. So and, um, for this purpose, um, we compute um, the Q-square value. And um, if the Q-square value is larger than zero, if it's positive, in that case, PLS SEM beats this naive mean value prediction benchmark. So this is definitely a first advantageous result and um, would bring us on, um, on the right track um, to have some predictive power assigned to our PLS pass model. So let's make it a little bit more complicated. And um, a more complicated benchmark would be the linear model um, benchmark. And what we do here is we look at the indicators of our um, exogenous constructs and um, we use um, our indicators of the endogenous constructs as dependent variables in a regression model. So what we do is um, we take um, an indicator of an endogenous construct and regress all indicators of the um, and regress it on all the indicators of um, the exogenous constructs. We will explain it um, in a little bit more, more detail in an illustration, but um, that's the idea. So what you have between um, the dependent or the endogenous constructs and the exogenous constructs is the PLS path model. And um, when we use the linear model benchmark, we simply or directly regress the indicators on the endogenous end, the target indicators on all the exogenous um, indicators and thereby um, we are capable to compute the prediction error as well. And what we would like to see is that the prediction error of PLS SEM is lower than that of um, the linear model benchmark. So that is um, the goal when we use this a little bit more complicated um, benchmark for assessing the predictive uh, power of our PLS path model. So let's go into the linear model in a little bit more depth. And what we explained is when we use the linear model benchmark, we already discussed uh, that we use um, the indicators on the endogenous end of a certain target construct. And on this uh, specific indicator, we regress all the indicators of the exogenous side. So what comes into such a regression model? What we see here highlighted um, in light blue is the indicator customer loyalty one, COSL one. And um, this is um, one uh, of the indicators of our target construct customer loyalty. And what we now do is um, with the linear model uh, benchmark is we regress this indicator customer loyalty one on all the indicators that are highlighted in green. These are all the indicators of our exogenous constructs in the PLS path model. So these are the eight quality indicators, the five performance indicators, the five customer social responsibility indicators, and three attractiveness indicators. So in sum, what we have here is, if I'm not mistaken, 11 indicators, and we regress customer loyalty one on all 11 um, indicators that are highlighted in green. 
So that is the direct regression of customer loyalty on um, the indicators of the exogenous constructs. And we thereby um, assume that a PLS path model does not stand between um, customer loyalty and the exogenous constructs indicators. So the idea is, the question that we'd like to answer, does a PLS path model that you see in between our um, endogenous indicators and the exogenous indicators, does the PLS path model in fact add value in form of predictive capability and in form of predictive value? So if the PLS SEM predictive uh, prediction error is smaller than that of the direct regression of the indicators on the exogenous indicators. In that case, we would assume that um, our PLS path model has predictive power and predictive capability when we beat the direct uh, linear model regression. So let's bring this into a systematic procedure. Um, we now have our PLS path model, which we can use for out of sample prediction. We have two benchmarks, namely the first naive benchmark that is a mean value uh, prediction and a second benchmark, which is a little bit um, stricter. That is the linear model uh, benchmark where we regress uh, the indicators of the endogenous construct on all the indicators of the exogenous construct. So and, um, now to start, with a systematic procedure, um, we run PLS predict and um, we need to select a number of folds. What we usually do um, in practice and what we select as a default is 10 folds. And um, what we also do is we randomly repeat the procedure about 10 times, just to make sure that the um, assignment of observations um, into the 10 different folds doesn't have a certain systematic pattern so that all, let's say, dissatisfied um, uh, customers randomly end up in fold number one and thereby um, provide extreme results just to make sure that this random assignment is not somehow um, yeah, um, out, of, uh, out of bounds. Um, we just redo it 10 times and um, use um, 10 folds and 10 repetitions to get our results first for the Q-square predict results. And if the Q-square uh, Q predict result is negative, that this would indicate that we are not capable to beat our naive mean value um, prediction benchmark. And in this case, we would right away assume that the PLS path model has no predictive power. But if the Q-square predict value is positive, then we can already assign some predictive value to our PLS path model. And um, what we then do is um, we simply check if the prediction errors are highly symmetrically distributed or not. And um, if they are uh, symmetrically distributed, we usually use um, the root mean squared error as an evaluation criterion. So what we then simply do is we get as a result the RMSE for PLS SEM and we get the RMSE for our linear model prediction. And our decision criterion now is to see if the RMSE value of PLS SEM is smaller than that of the linear model. And that's what we would like to do for all indicators of a certain uh, construct. So remember our example, um, the example from the previous slide, we had customer loyalty as a dependent variable with three indicators, customer loyalty one, customer loyalty two, and customer loyalty three. And we now do this check whether the uh, root mean squared error of PLS SEM is smaller than that of the linear model benchmark for all three indicators separately. And if PLS has a lower prediction error, in all cases, then we come to the result here on the right hand side. If this holds for all indicators of an endogenous construct, we would assign high predictive power of the PLS um, path model for this specific construct. If this only holds for a majority of indicators, well, in this case, we would still assume that there is a medium predictive power. And if that's the case for a minority, then we still have 
uh, Q square, which is uh, positive, and at least one or, um, of the indicators in our example for which we are capable to beat um, the linear model benchmark. And then we would attribute a low predictive power um, to the model. And if none of the indicators um, can beat the linear model benchmark, in this case, we would also come to the conclusion, um, yes, it's a rather poor performance and there's not too much predictive power, which we can assign to the model since we are only capable um, to beat the mean um, value benchmark. So this would be the systematic procedure and you would run PLS predict um, for the selected target constructs of your model. In our corporate reputation model example, this would be customer loyalty, for instance, and uh, you would come to the final decision. Yeah, let's uh, take a look. Um, this procedure has been discussed in two articles and the articles are the original article, which we mentioned, the elephant in the room by Galit Schmuli and co-authors. And here you can read up more specifically the details on the linear model benchmark. And what we did together later on with Galit uh, Shmuli was um, to develop the systematic procedure which we just presented and we extended um, the procedure into the mean value benchmark, namely by introducing the Q-square predict value as a starting point for the assessment. Just to give you an outlook and if you like to train um, the PLS predict procedure for yourself. Um, we take just a look at the next slide. And here we have once again, the corporate reputation model example where customer loyalty represents um, the target construct. And if we run uh, the PLS predict procedure and to look at the results for customer loyalty one, two, and three, what we find here is we find positive results for Q square predict. And this means um, that we can already assign to some extent um, uh, predictive quality uh, to the PLS SEM model. And then we go into the next step and we like to compare the root mean squared error of um, PLS versus that of um, our linear model benchmark. And when we now compare these results um, for indicator number one, customer loyalty one, we get an RMSE of 1.300 for the linear model benchmark, the root mean squared error of, of customer loyalty one is 1.302. So we see the prediction error for this indicator is smaller for PLS and that's why it's advantage and advantages and that's why we use them, the green font to highlight um, that there is an advantage for PLS. And the same holds for customer loyalty two and customer loyalty three. And in the end, after going through our procedure, we first find um, QSphere predict is uh, positive. Secondly, um, we find um, that uh, PLS SEM has an advantage over the linear model um, uh, benchmark for all three indicators. We will come to the conclusion that the um, corporate reputation model, that this, this PLS SEM model has a high predictive power when it comes to customer loyalty. So this was just an intro and uh, this is what you can do for yourself and running smart PLS um, with a, a corporate reputation model example. And um, yeah, from here, I would um, switch now to Marco and um, he um, introduces the next extension of the prediction oriented model assessment um, that um, now builds on having a, a model that is assessed in a way that we can assign predictive power to it. Yeah, thanks, uh, Christian. Um, as uh, Christian said, um, we're going to be talking a bit now about uh, model selection issues. Um, and um, just turn on my camera here. There you go. And um, the following descriptions are grounded in uh, two papers, uh, which uh, we publish in the Journal of the Association for Information Systems. So even though you might not be working in that specific field, um, it's certainly relevant for all types of business research. And a more recent paper on uh, prediction-oriented model selection, which is uh, forthcoming in decision sciences. So what is model selection actually all about? Well, as the name implies, it's about selecting a model. Well, and in order to select a model, you need to first have multiple models, right? 
So you need to compare different types of models like these here. So um, you might have model number one, which is a rather small parsimonious model in which you have a certain endogenous construct, Y3 here, and two exogenous constructs. Well, you could also have a bit of a more complex model here, which you would focus as model number three, y, uh, model number three, where y three is actually predicted not only by y two and y one, but also by y four. And finally, you might have an even more complex model here, which we label here as model number two, in which not only y one, two, and four are predicting um, y three but also why one, two, and four are related among each other. So which one is the best model here? So you might have different reasons why you're coming up with these different types of models. For example, you have different theories which suggest a certain structure. You might be looking into different contexts um, in which these models are actually being used. And for example, in the one context, model number one makes more sense, whereas in the other context, model number three or model number two make more sense. So how do we select the best model here? But before we get to that point, I just want to emphasize the value added of these model comparisons, because it is actually not something that business researchers or social scientists in general do. Yeah, even though it's actually an integral part of scientific research, the scientific endeavor. It's been noted pretty early, actually here in the 60s by uh, John Plath in his really seminal paper on inference. Yeah, And he talks about the conflict of different explanations and that these are actually important for advancing science. So we need to stop taking certain rules or certain explanations as given but we should actually try to entertain a conflict between ideas. So this is what Platt clearly calls for. And in fact, this has been echoed numerous times and it's also been practiced actually in many uh, fields of scientific inquiry. For example, um, in uh, 2015, Nuzo she wrote a nice article in Nature on uh, behavioral biases that affect us as researchers. So, I'm a consumer researcher, so I, I deal with behavioral biases when it comes to like purchasing products, purchasing services. But needless to say that I myself am subject to these biases, not only as a consumer, but also as a researcher. So when I look into different models, I also have some type of ruling explanation or ruling theory. Um, so for example, there's a, something called the confirmation bias. So when I take a look at a certain phenomenon, I have a certain hypothesis in mind what I expect. And I'm actually unconsciously looking for supporting evidence. So what I'm not doing is looking for counter evidence. This is not a defect of us as humans. It is just the function that our brain executes to save energy because questioning the world, questioning our habits, questioning our understanding of the world takes up energy. And this is something our brain in its function principle tries generally to avoid. Yeah? So, but when we are aware of these biases, we can come up with techniques to counter them. And this is exactly what Nuzo describes in her article. And one of these debiasing techniques is look into alternative explanations, so allow for different types of models, allow for other causal chains, which we might not have on site in the first uh, instance, but which are reasonable based on theory and logic. This is actually something that econometrics researchers frequently do. So when, when you are working with econometric models, yeah, time series models or so, then uh, a common approach is a so-called general to specific approach. General to specific means that you first deliberately test an overparameterized model. What does that mean? Well, you take all the variables in, everything is included, and then you gradually kick out variables based on some criteria. For example, the change in the F statistic. Yeah? And 
this is done until a certain point is being reached. And in, at this point, a further reduction of the complexity does not improve the model. Yeah? So now you have a parsimonious model, which fits the data well. This approach, general to specific, or the idea of looking into alternative explanation has also been emphasized in the PLS-SEM context. So long ago, Herman Wald, the originator of the method, noted that the arrow scheme, the path was actually tentative, yeah, because the model construction is an evolutionary process. He called it like a dialogue between the researcher and the machine. And this dialogue requires you to look into different models and then select the best model, whatever it actually is. Yeah. It's also been as, um, emphasized here more recently in the MISQ editorial where Geffen and colleagues says, well, um, looking into model selection or selecting different types of models is crucial because omitting significant predictors can bias other path estimate. Yeah. So they also understood the value of looking into different types of models. So, but how do we do that? Yeah. At this point, it's probably useful to look into related literature, namely in regression. And if you take a look at regression literature, there are so-called model selection criteria. And the most popular type of model selection criteria are the so-called information criteria. Information criteria because they're based on what we call information theory. It's about processing signals, data processing, and the, was the, like general framework theory for data or signal processing. And one of the um, most crucial and actually the initial criterion that was introduced here was actually proposed by uh, this young man, Akaike. Um, he introduced a criterion which is called AIC, which stands for, guess what, Akaike's information criterion. And it's a standard criterion that you get actually in most regression outputs. So if you run a regression, say in Stata, in R, um, also in SPSS, actually, you get, um, or you can actually request this AIC. The AIC strikes or tries to strike a balance between two different aims that you can follow when estimating a model, namely having a good fit, and having a parsimonious model, meaning a small model. Having a parsimonious model is actually an important goal in research. Why is that? Because, well, if you have a small model, this small model is likely to generalize better to different settings. Uh, you as a researcher, you can only look at one specific setting. For example, you might be interested in the satisfaction of visitors of a certain hotel in Malaysia. Yeah. But whatever you find, find out, you hope that you can generalize or others can generalize your finding to different settings, like to other countries, for example. So if you have a very complex model, which takes into account all the specificities of this Malaysian context of this specific hotel, well, it's very unlikely that this model is going to be useful for different settings because it's been like tailored to this specific instance that you're looking at. So you wanna have a general model, which you can use in different settings. Yeah? So having a parsimonious model is a goal in itself. Yeah? But the problem with smaller models is they don't fit the data well, uh, because obviously if you have a very large model, which takes all into account these, all these specific aspects of the current setting that you're looking at, well, it's very likely that this model fits the data much better than only a small model. So there's a trade-off having a complex model, which fits the data well, but doesn't really generalize well to other settings, or having a small model, which generalizes well to other settings, but may not perfectly fit the data. And the ARC, for example, tries to strike a balance here. So you see minus two times log likelihood. So the likelihood is just um, an expression of how well the data, uh, the model fits the data. So on the one hand, we are looking at the likelihood, but then we have a penalty factor, which is labeled here PK, which tells us about the number of parameters, for example, the number of predictors we're using in, say, a regression model. Having more predictors means more complexity, more complexity means a bigger um, penalty factor here. So there's a trade-off between these two extremes. Yeah? And AIC strikes it by introducing this two times PK. 
Two is actually called the magic constant. Yeah, whatever makes it magic, I don't know. Yeah, but it's been derived uh, statistically. But other researchers have proposed other constants like three times PK. Uh, so that's AIT3. There's also the AIC4 with, where the two is replaced with a four. Then we have the BIC here, which is actually looking very similar uh, as the AIC, but it's like based on a totally different philosophy. Yeah, the, the formulation is very much the same, as you can see here. The two is replaced with the log n, so n being the number of observations, but yet it's totally different uh, how it's actually been derived. There are yet other criteria which take log n plus one. So kind of the lay user looks at this and might be a bit bewildered or amused because the differences between the criteria are really marginal. But in fact, um, they've really performed differently. Yeah, so they have totally different characteristics in favoring very complex models, favoring too small of a model, or reacting differently to an increase in sample size or increase in the dispersion of the data, for example. So we can actually apply these um, criteria to PLS because, well, PLS is a regression-based approach. But what you notice now is, well, there's a log likelihood here. So where does the L actually come from? Yeah, the log, uh, like the likelihood. We are not using a maximum likelihood approach here. That's true. Yeah, but these criteria can be generalized to a non-likelihood setting. They have been defined also in terms of the sum of squared error. And the sum of squared error is simply something you get from any um, regression output. Yeah, for example, from the computation of the R, the coefficient of determination, which is also considering the sum of squared error in its computation. So the AIC here is defined as n times log, and you can see the rest here on this slide. This is, by the way, also the reason why the different statistical packages like R, Stata, SPSS readily give you the ARC and BRC in the output. Yeah, because th there's not like a separate routine running in the background estimating the same model using a maximum likelihood approach, but they are simply using these general formulations of these criteria to come up with the criterion values. Yeah, not that difficult, but well, very difficult to accept for one of the reviewers of our JIS paper that this is actually happening. So what we did, actually, we looked into the performance of these criteria. And there are many criteria out there. Actually, there are over 200 that you can readily compute. As I said, there's AIC, AIC3, AIC4, you get AICU, HQ, HQC, and many, many, many more. Yeah. And what we actually found out is that two criteria are particularly well suited for model selection in PLS, namely the BIC, which you can see here on the slide, and another criterion called the GM. So what we did is we um, produced a certain or assumed a certain model. So what we did is we assumed a certain model, yeah, and we said this is our data generation model. So this is reality. Well, after that, we just changed the setup of the model and said, well, okay, is the criterion or are these criteria able to detect a model misspecification? So do they point to the correct model? And we found out that the BIC and GM criteria are particularly well suited for this task. The AIC on the other hand, which you can see defined also in the slide here, is strongly favoring over parameterized models. So um, the saturated model, which has all linkages included. Uh, so it's actually well known for this behavior, gave us some confidence that our um, simulation results were actually accurate. So in the, this was actually what we did in this JAIS study. In a follow-up study, we were actually interested not only looking into this explanation and more theory testing perspective, but also in the prediction perspective. So you could think about the interplay between prediction and explanation as not really two extremes, but they are like different perspectives when you look into the estimation results of a model. Yeah. So you can either take it purely explanatory perspective, only theory, testing a theory, only looking into fit statistics, or you can look in the prediction perspective where you actually don't care about the model, really. 
Yeah, so the model can be grossly mis misspecified, but yet this model that is grossly misspecified does a fantastic job in prediction. So the true model, what I want to say here, the true model is not necessarily the best predictive model. But there's obviously a gray shaded area between these two. You know? So there could be models which are reasonably well fitting. So they are not like grossly misspecified. For example, they have all the relevant constructs in. They might have certain paths in, but some are missing. Yeah? But like the paths are in the right direction, for example, and the um, the cons actually all constructs that you would assume should be on board are actually included in the model. Um, and at the same time, this OK model does a very good job in prediction. And we actually want to find out, is there a kind of a sweet spot somewhere? Do our criteria able to identify a good model? Maybe not the best model, the true model, but at least a good model. Um, and are these criteria then also able to select the model with the best predictive power? And it's actually what, um, what we found out here. So we found out that the, the criteria which point at a good model, not necessarily the, the true model, but at least a good model, also have a strong tendency to predict the model with the lowest prediction error in terms of the RMSE, for example. So what does that tell us? Yeah, these criteria, they were actually the GM and uh, BIC criteria again. Yeah? These criteria seem to strike a good balance between explanation and prediction. So they point to a good model. And at the same time, this good model is actually excelling in terms of prediction. So if you want to try this out then, yeah, we could, for example, look at our three models that you saw in one of the previous slides, model number one, model number two, model number three. And what I haven't talked about now is, okay, what are these criteria actually looking like? What, um, what are these values representing? Well, they are scaled in such a way that a smaller value always indicates a better model. For example, here, in this case, we have three models. Model number one yields a BIC value of minus 328. Model number two yields a BIC value of minus 327. And we have model number three, which yields a BIC value of minus 317. Yeah, so as you can see here, model number one has the smallest value. And we're not talking about absolute values, which really talking about the smallest value. And according to the BIC, we would, in this case, favor model number one. But there's one thing that you might notice here. The difference between the BIC values are kind of marginal, right? So the model number one gets a value of uh, minus 328, and model number two is just slightly higher, just one point higher. Yeah? This is not really strong evidence. Would you really discard model number two based on this marginal difference? Yeah? And how about model number three? It's like not light years apart, it's only 11 points. And recall that the BIC is not scaled in a specific way. So we can say that the BIC varies between like a minus 1,000 and a plus 1,000. It can take any value. Yeah? It can be 200, it can be 1, it can be minus 200,000. Well, it's just a relative uh, statistic. Yeah? Just, we just compare the models relative to each other. The absolute values do not tell us anything. It's like with the RMSE, for example. So what we can do now, however, is compute so-called archaic weights. Don't be con uh, confused here. Archaic weights are not referring to the AIC criteria. The archaic weights are simply relative likelihoods for each of these models. And the relative likelihoods are computed, as you can see it here on the slides, so we always compute the delta values in a certain criterion, for example, in the BIC, relative to the best model. Yeah. And so in this case here, we just know there's a typo here. So this case should be uh, two, minus 328. So this is actually model number one is the best model. So this yields a delta value of zero. Again, there's typo up here. 
whereas model number two has a slightly um, worse BIC value, which gives us a delta of 0 0.641. And the model number three is actually the, kind of the worst one among the three with the largest delta value compared to the best model. What we do now is we compute these so-called archaic weights. Yeah? And these archaic weights are defined like this, as you can see them down here. Take the exponential value, power of minus uh, half times this delta value, which is pretty easy in the case of model number one. It gives us a one over the sum of the corresponding exponential values in the denominator. So we can compute now these um, archaic weights for all three models. And I'm just giving you like a general overview here. If you're more interested in that, I would strongly recommend looking into our recently published paper in JBR on model selection uncertainty and multi-model inference in PLS SEM. And you can see here that if we compute these archaic weights, first they add up uh, to one, that's a great thing. Yeah? And we see that we get a strong relative likelihood for the first model. We're talking about relative likelihoods here. So we can interpret this as the relative likelihood that this model is the correct model among these three models. And you can see that it's in the archaic weights is clearly supportive of model number one. Model number two is somewhat weaker, but it's compared to the relative differences in the BIC value, it's really mirrored in these relative likelihoods, it's much lower. And the uh, third um, archaic weight for the model number three is clearly rejecting this model. So this gives a bit more detailed insights into the different models and their efficacy. Yeah, so we would here conclude that Certainly, model number one has the strongest empirical support. By the way, that does not mean that model number one is the true model. It just means that relative compared to the other models, it is the best model with a certain likelihood. In this case, 57.74%. So you can read up on these uh, different criteria and these different research perspectives in our publications here in JIS, published last year um, in Decision Sciences, um, still forthcoming on prediction oriented model selection, and our recently published paper here in Journal of Business Research on multi-model inference in PLS SEM. And by the way, even if you're not using PLS SEM in one of your studies and like simple regression model, looking into model selections, looking into multi-model inference is really worth it. Yeah, it's uh, something that science really benefits from and I would strongly encourage you to consider this, yeah, at least in the follow-up analysis in your paper of these report alternative models, um, which gives additional support for what you are actually doing. If this was just too generic or too quick for you, uh, we were very fortunate to record a video on um, a platform called Latest uh, Thinking. So you can actually go to lt.org um, and I record a video here on our JIS paper um, on a model uh, comparisons. It's nicely uh, professionally made video by, a, by an independent platform. So look into this. And there are, by the way, also other nice videos, uh, not from us, but other researchers from different fields, astronomy, ecology, eco um, biology, uh, stats, and math. A very exciting platform. I can only recommend taking a deeper look into this. Yeah. So with that being said, I uh, hand over um, to Christian again, and he'll talk really quick about the different uh, models that you can look in uh, smart PLS. So, yeah, what you, Marco just introduced um, was uh, the model selection based on information criteria. And um, after maybe taking a look also at the video on the latest uh, thinking platform and getting an understanding uh, on the usefulness of uh, the predictive model selection, not only in PLS-SEM, but also in regression analysis in general. 
you may want to try it out by yourself and put this approach into action. And this is once again relatively easy when running Smart PLS and our corporate reputation model example. And what we see here on the left hand side, that is um, the corporate reputation model example um, with the two target constructs, customer satisfaction and customer loyalty. And uh, the two corporate reputation dimensions, competence and likability, which explains satisfaction and loyalty. And on the left hand side, we see our explanators of uh, reputation, namely quality, performance, corporate social responsibility, and attractiveness. And this is um, the original model. And um, the question that uh, you could ask yourself now is um, why you're not taking everything directly on customer loyalty. Of course, in the original model, we introduced customer satisfaction as a mediator and um, as a mediator of the two corporate reputation dimensions, competence and likability and their relationship to customer loyalty. And here you could ask yourself, why not uh, taking customer satisfaction out and um, testing this model, um, this more um, yeah, parsimonious uh, model against um, the model one. And when we yeah, run uh, the procedure, we get the BIC values and uh, the goal criterion is uh, to have the lower BIC. And uh, when we look into model one, it's minus 261.602. And for model two, it's minus 150.607. And uh, thereby we find we have the lower BIC value for the original value and would prefer the model one in its predictive capabilities over um, the model two. So this is just an example that you may want to run as a quick exercise um, after this presentation or later on. Good. So what we do now, we continue. And uh, once you start with a topic and uh, you dig deeper and deeper into the topic and you find it useful, uh, you further develop it. And uh, in this case, um, we found quite a lot of value when it comes to the predictive model comparison. And uh, in order to further extend um, this uh, approach, um, we developed uh, the cross-validated predictive ability test. This was a recent research pro uh, project uh, together with um, Benjamin Lingard, Pratyo Sharma, Thomas Halt, um, Martin Jensen, Marco, Joe Hare, and myself. And uh, the paper is called uh, Prediction COVID Yet Forsaken Introducing a Cross Validated Predictive Ability Test in Partially Squares Path Modeling. Um, and it was published in Decision Science. And we are now going to show you the results of this latest research on predictive model comparison. So let's go on. And um, what is the approach? And uh, the approach is, or the goal is um, to choose between two theoretically established models and their predictive performance. So this is what we always start with. And um, whenever you go into a certain research project, you may encounter a situation that you find that there is one theory in place and um, there's a new theory that has been established. And the question for your own research project is, which model should you, should you use? And um, if there are two competing theories as an author of a research paper that puts you always into a risk position and you would like to avoid if you follow theory number one and model number one um, to get reviewers of the other camp and vice versa. And for this reason, it is important to make a wise choice which model you would choose to later defend um, your choice. And a good defense might be on the predictive capability grounds. And um, for this purpose, um, we also uh, developed uh, the CDPET approach um, that allows you to do this model selection, but based on a statistical test. We ran simulation studies um, to ensure that this new test is reliable functioning in practical applications. And finally, we articulate guidelines on how to run uh, the CVPAD procedure and present an example. So let's get into the method. And uh, what we are now introducing is the famous American customer satisfaction index model. This is um, the second most 
applied PNS path model, which has been published in many A, A star journal articles. Um, and uh, I just mentioned it's the second uh, most uh, famous one. Uh, the number one PLS path model is certainly the technology acceptance model and its uh, yes, uh, successors, namely the TAM2, TAM3, UTAUT, and UTAUT2 model. And um, these uh, technology acceptance model, they have about four times more been published in um, uh, journal articles, including A and A star journal articles. And um, the reason why we choose the customer satisfaction model example is simply we got the original data. And uh, this is original data that we got from class Fornell on uh, customer satisfaction and customer loyalty. And um, and we run uh, the original um, uh, yeah, ACSI model with the original data um, just as a showcase. And what we have here is customer sat satisfaction as a dependent construct and it explains customer loyalty. And what we see on the left-hand side are explanators of customer satisfaction. And these are uh, the usual suspects like perceived quality, perceived value and customer expectations. And with, with this model, we are capable to explain 77.7% um, uh, uh, of customer satisfaction as expressed by customer satisfaction's R square value. So now we use um, this model and um, we continue. And um, when we continue and um, uh, we see um, newer publications certainly always reverting to the original customer satisfaction uh, index model. But um, when uh, going, uh, going on and uh, uh, taking a look at uh, some, re uh, some recent publications, after the original publication, which appeared in 1996 um, with uh, Klaas Fornell, Michael Johnson, and uh, Anderson and uh, Bryant, there were um, uh, a later publication by uh, Michael Johnson and Lars Olsen. And in this later publication, there was a difference. And here the model changed. And what they did in uh, this later model um, of the American Customer Satisfaction Index, um, in this later model, they switched the order between customer satisfaction and perceived value. So while in the original model, perceived value explains customer satisfaction, in the newer version of the uh, um, customer satisfaction um, model, customer satisfaction explains perceived value, and then perceived value explains customer loyalty. So here we have now two competitors in place. And uh, when you like to do some research um, uh, that is um, uh, related uh, to the Cust uh, American Customer Satisfaction Index model, the question is now which model to choose. And to answer this question, you could certainly build um, your research on the previously explained information criteria. And this is definitely a good start to get an indication whether um, you would go with the established model or join um, the perspective of the alternative model. But in some instances, um, the one or the other um, issue occurs. And um, this is um, first uh, that um, the um, differences um, between um, the BIC values can become very small. So um, if you have a BIC value of, let's say 1000, um, or let's say minus 1000 for the established model and minus 900, 98 for the alternative model, then you would have an indication in, uh, in the form of the information criteria in favor for the established model. But um, this difference uh, is only two uh, and relative to this absolute value of minus 1000, it's relatively small. And the question is, can you really um, um, build up your decision on this uh, relatively small difference? And for this purpose, um, the idea was um, to create a statistical test um, and a statistical test that allows you um, to show that going with the alternative model really um, improves statistically significantly uh, the predictive capabilities of your result. And another side point is 
simply um, the um, uh, information criteria. They use an in-sample um, prediction. And with a new procedure, the CVPET, we also wanted to provide an out-of-sample predictive um, uh, evaluation approach. So let's um, continue and uh, take um, uh, the starting point. And uh, this is quite a familiar slide. And uh, as the title of the CVPET already um, uh, yeah, introduces, um, we are reverting to a cross-validation procedure once again. And uh, similar to the PLS predict uh, procedure, we take our whole data set and we split our data set into a training data set and a testing data set in order to provide an out of sample prediction. And what we do here is we now compute the, the out of sample prediction error by um, using in this example five folds for the established model and secondly for the alternative model. So what we do is um, we run, um, uh, take model one and estimate um, model one for all the training data of faults number uh, two, three, four, and five, and use the estimated coefficients to predict the outcomes for our test data. And that is um, fault number one in the first row. And this is what we do next for fault number two, which becomes the testing data set. We again, estimate the model, but use a different training data set, um, which now consists of fold one, fold three, fold four, and five, fold five, and get the prediction error for fold number two. And by continuing this procedure, we get in the end, the prediction error of every single observation in our data set and, fold num uh, and uh, model number one. We do redo this procedure, and we get um, the results um, for um, model number two. And based on these prediction errors, we now continue the assessment. And the assessment goes uh, through several steps. And what we start with is simply to explain a little bit more in depth how we get the prediction error for model number one and for model number two. So what we do in step number one um, we take a look at our PLS model. Here's a super simple PLS model, three constructs, two indicators per constructs. We just use this simple model for illustra illustrative purposes. And um, in the first uh, step, we use the training data. So for the training data, um, we estimate the model um, that we see here and get all, um, all the coefficients. So we get estimations for all the relationships. Now we go into step number two. And what we do in step number two is we now take the test data and uh, the test data for uh, the indicators of the exogenous constructs. And these are the rectangles, which you see here uh, in blue. And uh, for these indicators, um, we now use the test data, but um, for the relationships between the indicators and the latent variables, um, which are also um, in blue here in this uh, step number two figure, we now use um, the coefficients of step number one. And what we do is we use the test data for the rectangles plus the coefficients of step number one to now estimate the latent variable scores of our exogenous constructs. And these results, um, the scores of the um, exogenous constructs, which we obtained in step number two, are now used in step number three to predict the scores of the dependent constructs. And what we do is um, we take um, uh, our scores from step number two of the exogenous latent variables. And for the relationships between the exogenous and the endogenous latent variables, we take the structural model coefficients that we obtained from step number one. So we see here um, three latent variables in blue, and um, we have the data for the two constructs on the left-hand side from step number two. We have the results for the relationships between um, the two constructs on the left-hand side and the target construct on the right-hand side from step number one. 
And based on um, this data, we can now predict the scores of our endogenous construct on the right hand side by using the step one coefficients and the latent variable scores obtained in the ste second step of the procedure. So in step number four, we take the predicted latent variable scores of our endogenous constructs and the outer relationships from step number one to predict the outcomes of the indicators in um, the endogenous constructs. And here, this is um, the prediction again for the indicators and the testing data. And uh, what we get at the end um, of step one, uh, of step number four is, we have predictions for every observation in our testing data set for model number one and model number two. And since we omitted this uh, fold uh, from our original data set, we certainly know what the observations are. And this allows us to compare our predicted values for model number one and model number two with the original observations um, that we have enhanced. And we are capable in steps number five and six to compute the prediction errors and the loss of model one and model two. We are now going to explain these terms in a little bit more detail, especially the loss term is not new. So when we look into our testing data and um, each fold once becomes the testing data set and we run this procedure for all the folds, that means we get predicted values for all observations in our data set for model number one and model number two. And what we also can compute is now for every single observation in our data set, the prediction error. And um, thereby um, we get the prediction error for every observation and it's sum of prediction errors of all um, the dependent indicators in the model. So we have the endogenous variable number one with three indicators. And with for each of these three indicators, we get the prediction error um, for the first observation. And maybe we have a second and third endogenous um, variable with additional um, indicators. And also um, the prediction errors um, for the indicators of the additional um, endogenous variables, they are also summed up. And thereby we get a loss figure, um, which is um, the sum of prediction error for the endogenous indicators and every single observation. So if we now have 344 observations in our data set, we get for every, um, for each of the 344 observations, um, uh, the loss, and uh, this is the loss for model one and the loss for model two. And um, what we can do in uh, the next step is to compute the average loss um, per uh, model. And that is simply summing up the losses per observation and dividing it by the number of observations. And thereby we get the average loss for model number one and the average loss for model number two. And um, the question now is, what is um, the average loss difference um, that we are looking at? And uh, we need to compute um, a, a test statistic um, to see um, if um, this um, value d bar is um, uh, significant. And um, when and what would we like to do with this uh, statistical test? We need to put it into a certain type of decision making. And as we started in the introduction, we uh, begin with theoretically established models. So we have our established model and we have our alternative model. And what we usually encounter is a situation in which we have um, one model that has been present for a long time, which is the original model. And then the new kit on the block, the challenging model, a newer model um, that has later on been developed. And um, what we would like now to see is um, whether the new model is capable to beat um, the established model and um, thereby um, has uh, a loss difference, um, which is um, in this case, um, in this case positive, 
which and has a positive value um, that is um, significantly different from zero. In that case, we would assume that we have, um, yeah, uh, that we have um, a predictive advantage with the alternative model, and uh, that this advantage is statistically significant. So, how do we do this? Um, we get the average loss of the established model, and uh, we get the um, is, uh, the average loss of the alternative model. And if the established model um, has a lower prediction error than the alternative model. In this case, um, this difference would be negative. And um, our decision criterion would always be if um, the established model has a smaller prediction error than the alternative model, we always stay with the established model. It becomes more interesting if the prediction error of um, the established model is larger than that of the alternative model. In that case, our alternative model has a higher um, predictive quality and the loss difference, the D-bar value would be positive. And now the question is, um, is this positive value, this prediction advantage of our alternative model is it significantly larger than zero? And for this purpose, we would run our statistical test. And if, um, uh, if uh, the loss difference uh, between uh, the established model and the alternative model is positive, and uh, in this case, significantly positive, only in this case, we would reject uh, the nil hypothesis and choose the alternative um, model. In other situations, when D bar is negative or D bar is positive, but not significantly different from zero, we would stay with the established model. So the decision criterion is relatively simple. You look for the loss, average loss difference between the established model and the alternative model, the D bar criterion. If D bar is negative, you choose the established model. If the D-bar is, um, is positive, um, in that case, um, you have uh, an advantage for the alternative model. And uh, then you need to decide whether um, this positive um, D-bar is significantly different from zero. If it's not significantly different from zero, you stay with the established model. But if the bar is positive, showing the predictive advantage for the alternative model and significantly different from zero, in that case, you would choose the alternative model. So this is the um, decision criterion or the decision making based on the CVPET procedure. And let's go ahead and um, take a look at a systematic procedure. And this is how you would put uh, CVPET interaction. But before we put it into action, we ran a lot of simulation studies uh, to show that uh, this procedure reliably performs. This is what we spared you um, from this presentation. If you take a look at the paper later on, you will find many um, simulations. One, for example, about CVPET's pre um, uh, power. And you will find um, that uh, CVPET um, has a relative, uh, relatively good power um, when it comes to applying um, this procedure. Secondly, you may ask um, the question, does CVPET always prefer um, the model with a higher number of relationships? No, it does not. So this is what we show in another um, simulation that CVPET does not systematically select over-specified models. And lastly, when you run a statistical test and you say, okay, I run this uh, statistical test with a 5% probability of error, does your test really meet this criterion? So is it well-sized? And what we also show in our simulation studies is that we have a well-sized test Meaning, if you assume a 5% probability of error, it delivers a 5% probability of error. In fact, it's a little bit more conservative. Um, um, we have uh, something around 5.8, uh, 4.6, um, 
which we show as a probability of error. So this is done by the simulation studies, um, which we do not present in detail in our presentation today. If you're interested in uh, that one, just take a look at uh, the original paper. What we now do is uh, we transfer the CVPET procedure um, as a test um, for a prediction oriented model selection uh, into a step-by-step -step approach. And the first step always is um, to revert to theoretically established models. So we are not hunting for models now, and we now we don't um, um, do randomly a random creation of all kinds of different models and simply um, look if there's any kind and or any sort of model alternative beating our original model. What we do is um, we choose two competitors based on theoretical grounds. And this is the starting point, having to theoretically establish model. In the second step, we run these models using PLSSEM and our data set. And for each uh, model, we assess the results and we need to make sure that we meet the relevant evaluation criteria for the measurement model and the structural model. And only if we meet these criteria for model one and for model two, we are capable to go on. If, for instance, um, we have a competitor, our alternative model, and our alternative model does not meet the rele relevant evaluation criteria, we would not continue this procedure because um, uh, uh, the results evaluation tells us that we, for instance, don't have reliable measurement models or that we don't have um, significant relationships in the structural model that we can revert on to. So after in step two, the results evaluation of model one and model two um, confirms um, that we can use both models. We then go into step number three, that is the CVPET um, model comparison. And uh, when we run this procedure, we get the average loss of model one and the average loss of model two. And based on these grounds, we now go into our decision making. If this difference is negative, we always stay with the established model. If the difference is positive, we then decide um, uh, to go with the alternative model only if this positive D-bar result is significantly different from zero. So this is uh, the simple procedure that we can go uh, through step by step and then come to the final decision making which model to choose. And um, we now continue with our example from the very beginning. And in our example from the very beginning, we once again have the established model and now the alternative model that has been proposed by Lars Olsen and Michael Johnson. And when looking at uh, these results, um, we get our average losses. It's 0.682 for the established model, and it's 0.690 for the alternative model. And here we find that uh, the difference of these losses, EM minus AM, which is our D-bar value, is minus 0.008. And um, since this result is negative, we stay with the established model and um, uh, uh, assume and assign a higher predictive quality to um, the original model that has been uh, proposed by Fonell and co-authors. So this little difference may be a little bit disappointing and uh, we can share at least um, uh, a secret with you. Um, during um, our, um, during um, our um, uh, yeah, test of alternative models. Um, we certainly found model alternatives that um, had um, a, a lower um, average loss for the alternative model. And we tested all different kinds of versions of the ACSI model. And there was the one or the other um, version of the ACSI mo model, which in fact had um, a, a lower loss uh, for the alternative model. But um, some of these versions 
were quite difficult uh, to theoretically substantiate. And um, even if you um, just look at what you can find in literature, um, these two, and you have to decide um, between uh, these two, even the small difference gives you a pointer towards the established model. And again, when can this be useful? First, if you start your project and you like um, to choose between one of these model alternatives, um, this result gives you a pointer, stay with the established model. But secondly, what also open, often happens is when you present your model and submit it, um, your research to a journal, what we encounter quite often is that we get reviewer comments. Reviewers saying, well, why didn't you include this relationship to your model? Or why is this relationship in this direction and not into the other direction? And in this case, it is um, certainly always important to make a theoretical argument why you established um, the model that you present in the first place. But in order to fully convince your reviewers, um, what can provide an additional substantiation if you offer the results of a statistical test like the CVPET, and if you then let your proposed model um, uh, yeah, and test it against uh, the alternative model that the reviewer proposed, and if you are then capable to show um, that on the grounds of the CVPET, um, there is an advantage for your originally proposed model, then you can provide the full um, uh, yeah, uh, confirmation to your reviewers and uh, have a good argument um, in um, the, the review process for your originally submitted model. So let's go on and um, take a look at uh, take a look at uh, um, uh, this research. So what we did is we published uh, the CVPET in the Decision Sciences paper. And um, again, if you like to play with a method um, for yourself, we made the resources available on GitHub and you find the link on this slide. Here we don't have a smart PLS implementation yet. What we offer is the R code to run the CVPET procedure. And secondly, you will find a Word document. And in this document, there's uh, the step-by-step -step approach how to run the R code on our corporate reputation model example. So now you ask yourself why the corporate reputation model example and not the ACSI as presented in the paper. Well, in the paper, we used the original ACSI data that we received from Class Fornell, but we don't have permission to make them public. But for the corporate reputation model um, example, we have data that we can make publicly available. And that is what you also find on GitHub. And um, with the corporate reputation model example, you can step by step run the CVPET procedure for model alternatives um, that we present in um, the Word document and in the R code, which we provide under this resource. And um, yeah, with this code and uh, this explanation, it should be pretty easy for you to run your own CVPET um, analysis. And again, its usefulness is when you start um, deciding which model to choose. And secondly, when you are in the re review process and the reviewer um, introduces certain model alternatives and asks, why didn't you use um, uh, this model alternatives or why didn't you change the path relationship in this direction? In this case, the CVPET is also super useful to convince uh, your reviewers. Okay, that was a, a short intro into the CVPET uh, procedure, our latest addition to the predictive model um, selection in PLS SEM. Marco, are you going to continue? Absolutely. Thanks a bunch. Um, so we tried to summarize the three key takeaways for you here. Um, so more like on a general note, maybe. Yeah? Um, don't be discouraged by the general focus on explanation and model fit. In fact, we think this is not really appropriate uh, when we talk about PLS models. Uh, model fit certainly has merits. 
but we saw like, especially in the covariance based SEM world what this model fit paradigm can actually uh, lead to namely extremely small models which might generalize well but which are so generic that they don't really add much value to our understanding of real, um, real world phenomena also by focusing on model fit um, well the reviewers and editors typically have certain thresholds in mind that they expect you to meet with your models and so the natural course of action is taking your initial model and modify it as long as it takes until it actually fits the data. This is not okay, but this is re research reality, let's face it. Yeah? And this is actually not what confirming theories is all about. It is about um, here totally going an exploratory route. And so the results of uh, much of what we see actually in structure equation modeling or what we have seen in the last decades is typically the result of exploratory research. Yeah, let's face it. So I think, and we think actually that the causal predictive paradigm is much more um, appropriate, especially in the social sciences where we wanna deal, uh, where we deal with actionable recommendations. So we wanna recommend to practitioners what they should be doing. So we sacrifice a bit of the model fit side, but get uh, a better focus on prediction. So a singular focus on model fit and model fit metrics, which by the way, in PLS um, have really been proven to not work very well, um, is from our point of view, rather problematic. Yeah, so rather focus on explanatory power assessment, the R square, focus on PLS predict, and this should be really a um, uh, standard approach in any PLS SEM assessment. This is also because, and that's the second uh, takeaway here, composite-based SEM is the method of choice for such analysis, simply because covariance-based SEM or factor-based methods in general are grossly unsuitable for this task, you know, simply because they, the assessment of the predictive power rests on certain assumptions, if at all. A Bayesian SEM proves pretty useful in that regard, but it places pretty high burdens on your data. Plus, it requires you to have certain assumptions regarding the price, for example. We think that this is not really the route to go. So when you talk about prediction, when you talk about causal predictive modeling, composite-based SEM is the method of choice. Three, the third takeaway, it's already what I envisioned a second ago, look into the predictive power of your model, use pre-LS predict, that should be part uh, of any analysis. And if possible, consider the model comparison as a viable option for your research. It's really not applicable to all studies, I must say, yeah? but um, you can either set up a study initially with the aim of comparing different theories, comparing different models, or you can use the model comparison as a type of robustness check, a follow-up analysis to find further support for the model that uh, you have been using. Similar to what Christian has shown in the ACSI model, you can just use different configurations of your model to find empirical support that your model is actually the best, com for example, compared to a saturated model. In doing so, you can either take a purely um, predictive perspective, like implied in CV part, or you can use the information criteria, which are striking a balance between explanation and prediction. Both approaches certainly have merit and they can actually also be combined with each other. So these are the three key takeaways and I hope you find them uh, useful for your research. Um, we have given you some references along the way to read up on these things. Um, so if you're interested, um, please contact us. We are happy to send the papers to you in case you don't have access, just contact us via ResearchGate. We're happy to share the papers there with you. So with that being said, Christian, I think I uh, hand it over to you for a final yeah. words of wisdom to our <laughs> um, great um, participants. Thank you very much, Marco, and um, yeah, as you can see, um, we are very much in prediction, and uh, this is one of those uh, topics uh, we are super interested in, because 
when you take a look into the natural sciences, um, they provide uh, a lot of value uh, to an approach to a model um, when it has predictive capabilities. And when you take a look into, into our management literature, you also find um, a lot of recommendations to managers, to practitioners, um, to business practice. And all these recommendations, which you usually find in the discussion part of the paper, is predictive in nature. But what is often not done is to further substantiate um, these uh, predictive or these predictions in the underlying research. And we find um, that this is definitely one of the core values of PLS SEM to do um, this kind of prediction model assessment and model comparison to further substantiate the recommendations that you later give to your, the managers and the companies in the decision, uh, in the discussion part. And um, we expect uh, quite some more research um, to see uh, in this direction and definitely before our PLS 2022 conference uh, finally starts. So again, um, our conference is scheduled uh, for um, uh, October uh, 2022. And uh, until this date, we would like to entertain you uh, some more with additional prelude sessions. So every half a year before the conference, you will find or you will see additional prelude sessions. So that means um, we're going to have um, uh, yeah, three more sessions and prelude number two is, has already been scheduled. And it's our pleasure and honor to have Nicole Richter and Sven Hauf on board. And what they're going to present on May 5, 2021 is the combined use of partially square structural equation modeling and necessary condition analysis. And that is what Marco just in the key takeaways um, explained. Um, the causal predictive um, nature and uh, purpose um, of a PLS SEM analysis. And what we can do is we can use uh, the necessary condition analysis to support the structural model relationships um, that we established uh, between the constructs um, that we are looking for. And uh, this procedure um, recently became quite famous in the wider management literature. And um, what has been done in the first publication is to bring um, this procedure, the NCA procedure, into connection with PLS SEM. And what Nicole Richter and Sven Hauf are going to do is they are going to show um, how this marriage has been done and how you can use um, NCA with PLS SEM results and get uh, the general value of this analysis into your uh, PLS SEM uh, project. So this is what we are going to do next on May 5, 2021. And uh, we will post via social media, um, again, the way how to register and uh, also will share the Zoom links with you. So next, um, then uh, it is certainly our pleasure and Ed is also on board um, to announce uh, the PLS 2020 conference and we are still hoping that uh, this will be um, capable to hold a presence in October uh, 25 to 28, 2021 in Beijing in cooperation with Beihang University and uh, Hu Wen Wang is our host at Beihang University and Eid um, Liu um, of uh, the Macau University of Science Act and technology is um, a host uh, who is strongly supporting and making uh, this conference happen. And uh, the four of us, um, we, we are the hosts of um, this conference. And uh, what we would like to offer is, besides our uh, prelude se sessions, which we step-by-step -step will announce um, with its topics, um, we will offer pre-conference workshops, a keynote speech by Joe Hare at the conference, research presentations, and a couple of uh, special issues. So just join um, our website, PLS2022.org, and take a look, for instance, at the publication opportunities that we offer in connection with our conference. And if you like to submit a paper, um, there will definitely be an opportunity um, into uh, 2022 and uh, the registration um, for the conference will also open again. And uh, we are 
yeah, very much hoping to have um, uh, a great crowd from all over the glo globe and uh, uh, get uh, the PLS uh, SEM community uh, together for some very fruitful um, discussions and interactions. And besides the valuable research um, presentations, the interaction is so much more important. And um, we hope um, to being able to facilitate this again. And uh, this is uh, the whole purpose um, of uh, this little endeavor here. So that's it for today for preload uh, number one. And uh, again, we are amazed by this large crowd from all over the globe joining us. Um, this is uh, definitely something um, which is super impressive and to get uh, the PLS SEM community together via um, this little event. And from my side, it's now to say goodbye. I enjoyed it a lot. And the last words are definitely with Marco. Tell us something wise. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> Other than that, I really enjoyed this time. Really, I'm I'm super impressed by by the international crowds. Isn't it great um, to to be joined by so many people from all over the, over the world? So again, thanks a bunch for your interest. Um, please contact us um, in case you're interested in any papers. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you at Prelude uh, number two soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>